Tomorrow on Live at 4, we go backstage with Michael Bruno to the CTM production of A Christmas Carol. And Lola's Lowdown will have the best animal stories of the week. That's coming up tomorrow on Live at 4. Thanks for watching tonight, everybody. News 3 at 5 starts right now. And right now at five, new information on the fatal Sun Prairie explosion. There will be no criminal charges filed. And where Republican legislative leaders stand on promises Governor-elect Tony Evers made during his campaign. A partial government shutdown could happen soon. What the president is demanding must be included in the bill. This is News 3 at 5. Thanks for staying with us, everybody. There will be no criminal charges in Sun Prairie's deadly explosion. City officials made the announcement after a 23-week-long investigation. Keely Arthur joins us live from Sun Prairie to explain their decision. Keely? Well, it's been four months since that explosion leveled the building that was behind me and burned down other parts of the downtown. Today, the Sun Prairie Chief of Police, Pat Anhalt, answering the big question, will people be charged criminally? He says no. Take a look at this dash cam video released earlier today showing the moment of that July 10th explosion that killed Captain Corey Barr. Authorities say the gas leak and subsequent explosion was the result of severe miscommunication rather than criminal behavior between companies USIC, Bear Communications, Jet Underground and VC Tech. USIC failed to mark a critical spot where fiber optic cables were being installed. A contractor with VC Tech then hit a gas line leading to the explosion less than an hour later. While no criminal charges are filed, some businesses impacted are contemplating civil litigation. I would just like whoever's responsible to take care of things. I don't I don't like going after people. I don't like having holding anger and I think that would do that, but I don't know what the future holds. And obviously, in addition to this being tough on businesses, a very tough time for the family of fallen firefighter Captain Corey Barr. His wife, Abby Barr, telling me today that she learned about this announcement on Tuesday ahead of the news conference. She said she's not going to comment on it publicly. She's also avoiding all forms of media so as to not see those very disturbing images and not have to relive that once again. Keely Arthur reporting for us tonight from Sun Prairie. Keely, thank you. A Marshall woman facing charges in the death of a Sun Prairie man has pleaded guilty. 52-year-old Michelle Goss pleaded guilty this morning to hiding a corpse in Dane County Court. Goss was in a nearby property when her fiancé, Daniel Leesky, shot and killed Jesse Faber in January. Court documents say Goss helped accompany Leesky to the shed where Faber's body was hidden before they moved it to a storage unit. I, I followed Daniel um, to a, 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 another location and picked him up when he parked the van inside a storage shed on Missouri Road in Marshall. Leesky's trial is set to begin soon. Sentencing for Goss is scheduled for April. Let's get a look at your first alert weather now. Meteorologist Dave Caulfield is on the weather patio. Hi, Dave. Hey, Charlotte. Yeah, the umbrella is up on the weather patio. We've had some light cold rain and maybe even some snowflakes mixing in over the past couple of minutes or so in Madison. Doppler track showing a few flurries, maybe some rain showers still out there across portions of southern Wisconsin, but really nothing, anything significant and nothing that we need to really worry about this evening. But we have the umbrella ready to go, especially over the next couple of hours. Platteville, maybe a few flurries earlier on the Queen Bee Radio Skycam, but right now not looking at too much. Our visibility has improved, especially across southwestern Wisconsin, up to six mile visibility in Madison. Still some dense fog closer to the lakeshore and Kenosha. Temperatures have fallen into the upper 30s in Madison and in Janesville. Still in the 40s in Milwaukee and Kenosha. 38 right now in Boston. Bell. That wind will be a little bit breezy at times over the next day to day and a half. Not too bad right now out of the north at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. But I think maybe that wind increases a little bit overnight. 
about 10 to 15 miles per hour out of the north, so making it feel a little bit chilly outside as those temperatures continue to dip through the 30s into the upper 20s to start our Friday. We'll talk about a couple of chances for flurries, but generally quiet weather, but chillier weather leading up to Christmas and your first alert forecast in just a few minutes. All right, Dave, thank you. With just two and a half weeks until a new governor is sworn in. We're taking a closer look tonight at where Republican legislative leaders stand on promises Governor-elect Tony Evers made during his campaign. Rose Schmidt explains the roadblocks they might run into. Rose? Well, Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald says Republican leaders plan to make their own state budget instead of using the one Governor-elect Evers proposes. He and Evers met privately this morning, but there are questions about whether the two parties can come together and find bipartisan ground just weeks after Governor Walker signed bills stripping powers away from the incoming governor. Governor Evers is going to be a breath of fresh air. After eight years with a Republican-controlled state house and legislature, Democratic leaders are hoping Governor-elect Tony Evers will help elevate their priorities. So I think his role is to represent the best interests of the state, uh, to fund schools, to expand health care, uh, to invest in infrastructure. That's what he campaigned on. I think that's what he's going to do. The biggest question, though, is will he be able to? Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald is preparing for a different kind of process than he's had under Governor Walker. The big difference is we won't be sitting in, obviously, um, Governor-elect Evers' office developing kind of a strategy uh, for the party. Evers made a number of campaign promises, including cutting income taxes by 10 percent, which is a conversation Fitzgerald is willing to have. Sure, we're open to it. I didn't, um, be honest with you, I didn't talk to the governor-elect about it this morning. But another one of Evers' campaign promises, legalizing marijuana for medical use, is not on Fitzgerald's agenda. No, I don't see it. I don't I don't see the support. I don't support it. Representative Hintz is making it clear that stripping powers from Evers is not a good way to start the new year. Uh, certainly Democrats in Wisconsin are going to play a bigger role, but I think, you know, we're going to have to choose whether we comp you know, compromise or gridlock and early signs from the Republicans are not promising. But, but the Senate's Republican leader is encouraging the incoming governor to sit down with every lawmaker and find common ground. That'll be the opportunity to kind of pull people in the room and say, okay, let's see if we can come up with some common goals here. Governor-elect Evers has also said he would accept federal Medicaid expansion money. Senator Fitzgerald says that's something he may be open to in a few months. Meanwhile, Speaker Robin Voss has said that expansion will not happen. We reached out to Evers' office for comment, but we have not heard back. Rose, thank you. President Trump is searching for a new defense secretary. James Mattis will be retiring at the end of February. Mattis says President Trump deserves a defense secretary whose views are better aligned with his and says he is, that's why he's stepping down. The president's announcement comes a day after he surprised U.S. allies and members of Congress by announcing the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria. He says a new defense secretary will be named shortly. House Republicans have added the president's demand for border wall funding to the Senate passed bill to avert a shutdown. But the battle seems far from over, with Democrats vowing to oppose the wall. After an hour-long meeting with the president this afternoon, House Republicans have put forward an amended version of a Senate passed bill to avert a partial government shutdown. The new bill would include the president's demand of $5 billion for a border wall. I've made my position very clear. Any measure that funds the government must include border security. Democrats are not budging on the wall. We favor smart, effective border security, not a medieval wall. Some House Republicans also want to add funding for disaster assistance to the spending bill. That is one area where there could be more common ground with Democrats. The House GOP's proposal now also includes $8 billion in disaster assistance with the deadline one day away. It's now unclear when the House will even vote on the measure. The Trump administration has reached an agreement with Mexico on how to process migrants seeking asylum in the United States. Effective immediately, refugees seeking asylum through the southern border will have to wait in Mexico while their paperwork is being processed. The new policy claims it will allow officials to focus more on those who are actually fleeing persecution and cut down on false claims. Affected migrants will receive humanitarian visas to stay on Mexican soil. They will be given the ability to apply for work and be given other protections while they await a U.S. legal determination. 
U.S. Customs and Border Patrol officials say currently only about 9% of those seeking asylum in the U.S. have it granted. President Trump is defending his controversial decision to bring 2,000 U.S. ground troops home from Syria. On Twitter this morning, the president wrote, Does the USA want to be the policeman of the Middle East getting nothing? And last night, the White House tweeted a video. The president made the move against the advice of his top national security advisors and ordered the pullout be completed in 30 days. The Madison Community Foundation announced today $813,000 in community impact grants to 22 nonprofits. The grants support race equity, academic achievement, STEM learning, entrepreneurship, reading and literacy, nonprofit groups, arts environment, and much more. Out of the 22 grants that were awarded today, the largest includes $100,000 to the Goodman Community Center building an expansion project. We're proud to help large nonprofits scale uh, their impact in our community and smaller nonprofits introduce innovative programs uh, into the field. Um, when it's all said and done, it's about our vision, which is really to create a vibrant and generous community where everyone thrives. The Madison Community Foundation has given over $2 million to local organizations during 2018. Today is the last day to send all first class and priority mail for it to make it to the destination in time for Christmas. Well, there goes my parents' Christmas gift. <laughs> right now, the U.S. Postal Service is working 24-7 to make sure your items get to where they are going. The Postal Service expects by the end of the holiday season to have processed more than 16.2 million pounds of mail. This is the busiest week of the year when it comes to mailing, shipping, and delivery. Today is expected to be extra busy because it's an important deadline, so officials encourage you not to put it off until closing time. After work, people will be coming and uh, dropping off their stuff, uh, trying to you know, get those last minute packages in the mail. If perhaps you can't get that mail out today, you still have the express option. As long as you have your stuff in by Saturday and pay a little extra for being last minute, USPS says it will arrive on Christmas Eve. Badger head football coach Paul Christ says sophomore quarterback Jack Cohn will be the starter when the Badgers play Miami in the Pinstripe Bowl. Coach Chris said that Alex Hornibrook will not start due to his ongoing head injury. Since Cohn will play in five games this year for Wisconsin, his sophomore red shirt will be pulled. Hornibrook did not play in three games this season due to a concussion. The Badgers will take on the Miami Hurricanes in the Pinstripe Bowl on December 27th. There's more to come on News 3 at 5. Up next, Harvey Weinstein is in court today. Why his lawyer wants his client's case thrown out. And two Chinese nationals have been charged with hacking into U.S. government agencies. We'll have the very latest. And here's a look at your stocks. The Dow is down 464 points. The Nasdaq also down 108 points. S&P down nearly 40 points. We'll be right back.
Disgraced Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein lost his bid this morning to get the sexual assault charges against him thrown out. Dozens of women have accused Weinstein of improper sexual behavior, sparking the Me Too movement. He is being accused in two cases, charged with raping a woman he knew in a hotel room in March of 2013 and forcibly performing oral sex on another woman in 2006. Weinstein's lawyers had tried to get the case tossed, arguing that a police detective had acted improperly in the investigation, but the judge didn't buy it. His lawyer took aim at the Me Too movement after the hearing. A movement should not, however, be permitted to push an indictment that is deeply flawed. This indictment was based on evidence and testimony before the grand jury. It was not based on the Me Too movement. Afterward, Weinstein's attorney called the judge's decision a technical ruling on the law and expressed confidence the former mogul will be completely exonerated. The Justice Department has announced charges against two Chinese nationals. They say they were involved in an extensive hacking campaign against U.S. government agencies and private companies. The pair was allegedly part of a group called APT-10. Federal officials say they targeted more than 45 companies and agencies in at least 12 states including NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy. China's goal, simply put, is to replace the U.S. as the world's leading superpower, and they're using illegal methods to get there. The defendants used spear phishing to install malware that stole the usernames and passwords of employees of the victim companies. The two hackers charged in this case remain at large, and it's unlikely they will be extradited to the U.S. Let's get a check on weather now. Meteorologist Dave Caulfield joins us now with a look at your first alert forecast. Hi, Dave. Hey, Charlotte and Susan. We had some rain showers earlier today in Madison, and right now on the weather patio, a few light rain showers are continuing to fall. Maybe a few snowflakes trying to mix in at times. Really not looking at anything significant precipitation-wise into this evening, but don't be surprised if you kind of look up and you feel a couple of drops of something over the next few hours. But as a cold front continues to move through the region, that's helping to create some of the lift that we're seeing on radar across Dane County. High temperatures today, another day in the low 40s in Madison, 43 in Janesville and in Boscobel, 40 even in Platteville. That may be a little bit deceiving because a lot of the day we were kind of stuck in the upper 30s and it felt a little bit chillier with a northwesterly wind but all technicalities. Temperatures right now are in the upper 30s in much of southern Wisconsin. Still in the 40s, though, closer to Milwaukee and Kenosha. Downtown Madison on the Edgewater Skycam. It was a gloomy Thursday, kind of a cloudy Thursday for many of us and a little bit of some rain falling right now on our Edgewater sky cam. Today's high of 42, still about 10 to 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. And that really goes to show you how long this mild stretch of temperatures have been. Mild weather stretch has been in town across southern Wisconsin. Seven straight days now of 40 degree high temperatures in Mad City and Winter actually begins tomorrow. It's hard to believe because we've been dealing with the 40s and temperatures about 10 to 15 degrees above normal pretty consistently. But tomorrow at 4.22 p.m. to be exact, remember the winter solstice, the day with the least daylight, about nine hours on the way for tomorrow. So hopefully we can get that clearing a little bit early. Otherwise, we're not going to see much sunshine to kind of welcome in winter. The North Pole tilted, thir uh, not 32, 23 and a half degrees away from the sun for those playing at home. And after tomorrow, there's a slight increase in daylight each day after as we go into the winter months. And spring just around the corner. Just tell yourself that when temperatures are a little bit chilly, but we're still running about five degrees above normal into much of next week and to end the month of December and 2018 as a whole. So that's good news. A little bit of some flurry activity is set for some days coming up, but really no substantial snow system 
on the way, at least not on our horizon just yet. Tonight, rain and snow ends breezy and colder with temperatures in the upper 20s. We're a little bit colder tomorrow as well. Breezy with some clearing possible late and temperatures in the mid 30s. So future track show not too much in the way of activity left over tonight for Friday. Temperatures starting off in the upper 20s. You can see a little bit of that clearing, especially for southwestern Wisconsin, possible later on Friday. But that clearing is short lived because the clouds come back for Saturday and maybe a few flurries as well. Nothing that will accumulate, but don't be surprised if we see a few snowflakes early on Saturday. Then we're seasonably chilly and fairly quiet leading up to Christmas. A few more flurries may greet us on Christmas morning, which would be kind of nice. Temperatures will be in the upper 30s for Wednesday and Thursday, and some rain showers are possible, possibly mixed with snow at times, especially north of Madison. So we'll keep an eye out for that, but still pretty quiet leading up to the holidays. Here is a look at your first alert traffic update. We had that major accident at Park Street and the Beltline westbound about 30 minutes ago. That has been cleared, but still there's going to be a lot of kind of residual delays on the Beltline. So keep that in mind. Very slow in both directions. Lots of red and yellow showing up. So no major accidents or incidents to report right now, but still some hefty delays showing up. Verona Road to John Nolan, that's up to 14 minutes eastbound, average speed of around 20 miles per hour, and some other routes in and around Madison, northbound downtown to Sun Prairie, running a little bit slow on 151. That's 21 minutes with an average speed of around 25 miles per hour. And that is your first alert traffic update. So temperatures are going to be a little bit chillier, but still it could be worse this time of year. I know a lot of folks want that white Christmas. Mm -hmm. but it just doesn't seem to be in the cards. All right, Dave, thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Still to come at five, the Federal Reserve announces the fourth interest rate hike of the year, what it means for you after a short break.
The Federal Reserve announces the fourth interest rate hike of the year yesterday. Get ready for wide-ranging changes for all of us who use credit cards, have loans, and savings accounts. In today's Consumer Watch, Mary Maloney explains the direct impact all of this will have on your wallet. If you save, invest, use credit, or want to buy a home or a car, listen up. The Federal Reserve announced its fourth interest rate hike of 2018. And during that period, we've had low unemployment and strong growth. This time, it's by a quarter of a percentage point to a range of two and a quarter to two and a half percent. And financial experts say the raise will impact nearly everyone. Where people are going to feel impact is if the market is going to respond to this. And that immediately impacts your 401k, right? For borrowers, it's going to cost more for credit cards, loans, and mortgages. The pace of the impact will vary, but experts say credit card users will feel the effect first because those rates are directly in line with the Fed's increases. So literally by their next bill, they could see an increase in that interest rate. Depending on how much you owe, that could mean a lot of extra money even on your minimum payment. For savers, experts say this latest hike will translate into more earnings on deposits in a savings account. Interest rates going up is actually a great thing for someone close to retirement because it means their safe money might actually get a decent return. Despite the increase, federal interest rates are still at historically low levels. So if you're looking at a long-term loan, now is still a great time to look at that. And I can tell you, in five or six years, it's going to be very different. For Consumer Watch, I'm Mary Maloney. Since 2008, interest rates have been close to zero as part of the Fed's strategy to get out of the recession. But as the economy improved, the Fed has been increasing rates little by little. Another check of your forecast when we return.
A little rain outside today. Yeah, and some uh, snowflakes trying to mix in in some spots, but really not a major deal. I think that will be out of here in the next couple of hours. Then we'll see those cloudy skies continue into much of tomorrow. But on Doppler track, uh, couple of those snowflakes and raindrops still trying to fall across Dane County. Temperatures are in the mid 30s. By the time we get to the start of tomorrow, it will be cloudy with temps in the upper 20s. Then highs only in the mid 30s tomorrow. So you'll feel that cool down outside and seasonably cold and pretty quiet as we head closer to Christmas. All right, Dave, thanks. We'll see you back here at six.